gentlemen, and welcome to this Convergent Science Network presentation. My name is Cameron McKnight, and this is Bethany Davey, and we are pleased to be your host this evening. This evening, we have an outstanding leader in musculoskeletal oncology with us. Um, she also works in advanced robotic assisted surgery and 3D printing. Dr. Claudia Di Bella received her education at the University of Bologna, which is the oldest continuous school of medicine in the world, established around 1200 AD. Dr. DiBella moved to Melbourne in 2009 and qualified as an orthopedic surgeon in 2014. She has since gone on to be centrally involved in the development of the cartilage regeneration program at the University of Melbourne and is actively involved in the Biofab 3D biofabrication facility at St. Vincent's Hospital, which some of you may have actually visited recently in our uh, opening the vault program. We're very much looking forward to this evening's talk, so please help me in providing Dr. DiBella a warm welcome. Thank you, and thank you for coming despite the terrible weather today. Um, so I'm Claudia Di Bella, and I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and like my five-year-old son likes to say, I um, fix people, uh, which is something that I'm proud of, and I like to, uh, to think that that's what I do. But as an orthopedic surgeon, uh, sometimes is, uh, uh, there are different ways of fixing people or fixing bones. Uh, but what I do is I, um, I'm an oncological orthopedic surgeon, so I treat bone and soft tissue tumors, and that's my area of specialty. But also, um, obviously, uh, I like to do joint replacement when I, when I feel like relaxing in surgery. Um, and one of the things that has always um, made me passionate about surgery is the possibility of using new techniques and in innovative techniques to um, achieve better results and to, to get um, better outcomes to our patients. And in fact, with my other hat, I run a lab, which is a 3D printing and uh, bioprinting um, lab at, uh, at St. Vincent's Hospital in the Biofab 3D. Uh, where we try and regenerate cartilage, but in general, musculoskeletal tissues. And in this talk, I will try and um, discuss with you and, and, and uh, show you the advantages that, that sorry, the advances that we have done in, uh, in surgery in the uh, recent years and where uh, hopefully we're going to get um, soon. So the way we started is, you know, obviously, uh, modern surgery started uh, many, many years ago. And funny enough, I, I think the boy was a, was a German surgeon in 1880, he said that surgery had made immense progress and seems to have reached the highest possible degree of perfection, which uh, was uh, pretty interesting in 1880. But that actually is the start of modern surgery where uh, we, we managed to start having as surgeons good results so much that surgery was started, started to uh, take place more and more often. And the reason why we, we got to that point was that Techniques such as anesthetics, antiseptics, analgesics, antibiotics, and anticoagulants really started to shape the way in, uh, um, in surgery. So we could perform surgery without um, giving patients crazy pain during, during procedures. Uh, we managed to uh, optimize our sterilizing uh, procedures and to give antibiotics so the patients didn't get septic after surgeries. Um, and also, obviously, with the uh, painkillers and anticoagulants, we really started to get very good results. But uh, one of the things that was lacking in, in modern surgery was tools. So things that could help us, help the surgeon, on not just diagnosing uh, the, the, the diseases, but also approach surgery in a different way, in a way that can uh, really be much more accurate and much more reproducible. So these tools obviously started to um, come into place uh, later than 1880. Um, one of the biggest examples, and I think this um, uh, really uh, what made us as orthopedic surgeons considered well around the world was this history of hip replacement. Because hip replacement, even now, has been, is considered one of the most successful operations in the history of all surgery, uh, which is pretty impressive if you think about, you know, that's orthopedics. Um, and, you know, it, it's a very, very long journey on how hip replacement started to be. And originally it was just a um, hemiarthroplasty, so just changing half of the hip and really was just resurfacing at the beginning, but was the constant attempts on improving that made us achieving the results that we have today. So as an example uh, on how things go, um, this is what, you know, what we do when we do a hip replacement. We, we have something that is, um, this is the hip joint, and this is the way it would look on, on an x-ray here and on a, a scheme in there when we got bad arthritis. So it's the bone on bone that um, 
a lot of people usually hear. So usually there is a good normal space in the joint line, and when instead we have arthritis, we have the bone on bone. So there is normal space in between uh, the two bones, and it's really painful to try and uh, move around. Very common, obviously, in the hips and in the knees. So walking becomes a problem. Um, so it's a mechanical problem. So it's something that we as surgeons can, can really um, help fixing. And what we do is basically changing the, uh, the, the parts that are in, in contact and we put a, a metal prosthesis. And, um, you know, when we started using metal in, uh, uh, in surgery, it wasn't, wasn't something, you know, straightforward. Uh, there were multiple attempts, but now what we can do is that by putting a metal prosthesis uh, in the femur and another metal bit in the acetabulum and, and uh, have a special plastic in between these two bits of metal, 98% of patients can have fantastic results. They're happy, they walk again, they have no pain. So it's, it's, it's great because you can, you, you can really have someone that from not being able to, um, you know, get up from, from the bed comfortably uh, to a chair can really now start walking again. Having said that though, if you go into an orthopedic, in, into an operating theater, this is what you would see before any hip replacement. So you would have the surgeon that puts a template uh, on, on top of, of an x-ray and literally draws on the x-ray film or where the cuts are going to be, where, you know, what the size of the prosthesis is, the size of the stem, where, you know, where the, the acetabulin is going to go. So you can imagine how hard it is to actually match this to then what we do really when we open up and we try and reproduce what we're trying to do in, in, um, before surgery. Also, this is all in 2D, so a lot of the, the 3D variables are not really seen, but this is actually the way we still do hip replacement. So what happens is that sometimes we think we've done a great job, it looks good, an x-ray looks good, but you know, at an at a expert eye, you can see that there is some problems here, for example, on this left side, the acetabulum is not in the right position, and that's why sometimes you know, we have this problem, like a hip dislocation. And the reason why we can have these problems is that what we rely on when we do surgery is what we can see. So it's all about our technical abilities to match what we see, what we plan before, to actually what we do in surgery. And it's, you know, we can't expect everyone to have the same technical abilities, but also we can't expect all the patients to be the same because, you know, it's, it's, it's very, the, the variability in there is, is huge. Same thing, similar thing happens with knee replacement, even in uh, more, um, in, in higher numbers. So if we don't put a knee replacement nice and straight following perfect lines, uh, we have an uneven loading on the components and that that's what happens, what we call catastrophic wear. So these patients, I can promise you, they're not happy and it's really difficult to fix this. And the reason why we have these problems is that we still rely on our technical capabilities and, and manual skills that, you know, are not necessarily always um, perfect. Also, we have sometimes a problem. So what we can see and what we can, you know, the, the points that we can access are really hidden and are really deep down in a big hole. And I can promise you that the, the concept, doctor, I've got big, heavy bones, is not actually true. Um, it's actually quite common that people that are quite big uh, have little bones and sometimes not that, uh, not that strong. But what I, I want to show you here is that it can be really difficult because all we rely on when we do surgery often, especially in orthopedics, we rely on landmarks. And these landmarks, we can feel them, you know, in a knee, we can feel them in a the hip, but sometimes we can't. And when we can't, that's when, you know, things can be put in a different, you know, in a wrong position. So one of the first things that started to come into place is navigation in surgery. This started to be a reality probably 15, 20 years ago. Um, and what this is, is that we put markers on, on the patient's bones. So for example, in this scheme here, you can see that we put two pins in the tibia uh, and a couple of pins in the femur. And then we got these little balls in there. And these balls in there communicate with the system. So it can really read where these bones are in place. But the only way for them to read it is that we have a pointer. And what we need to do is to point exactly at certain landmarks. So basically the computer makes an algorithm and based on where we put our landmarks, it creates a, 
a fake knee in this case. And so then after doing that, it tells us where we should put our cuts. So if I put the landmarks of the um, lateral epicondyle in the right spot, and the middle epicondyl, uh, epicondyl in the right spot of the ankles, uh, and the center of, the, of rotation of the hip, if all these are correct, then the computer generates a, a, a picture um, that tells me, okay, well then in that case, to have a perfect alignment of this knee, you need to cut here and here, and then you have, uh, you have your perfect knee. What's the problem with this is that sometimes we can't really access the correct landmark. So sometimes if my landmark is a centimeter away from the, pl from the place where it's supposed to be, then the computer tells me to cut on centimeter in a, in a wrong angle. That means that you know, my prosthesis is not in the right spot. So even if this is, is being the first big advance in, uh, in joint replacement surgery, still had some problems so much that there were no clinical trials that actually de demonstrated that, this, that the results obtained with navigation were actually superior to the results um, obtained with a standard uh, joint replacement surgery. But another place where navigation started to have uh, and is now having a, a great impact is actually in orthopedic oncology or in, in, in oncologic surgery in spine, for example. So this is an example of a patient, and I'll try not to put any bad videos or anything, but you know, just uh, raise your hand if you don't like that, and I'll move forward. Um, this is an, an example of a patient that is under here, under all these, um, these drapes, and this is a CT scan that we can actually do during surgery. It's called OARM, and basically we can make a CT scan live with the patient in surgery, in the position um, of, um, of surgery, so where I'm, I'm supposed to operate. If you can see here, this patient has a little marker that is, in this case, positioning his uh, pelvis. So basically, the, the, the CT scan can understand, one, where the pelvis is, and two, where this marker here is in relation to the pelvis. So what happens is that then after the CT scan is, is done, I can see where my instrument is in relation to the pelvis, because you can see the relationship with the, uh, with the marker that is stable in that pelvis in there. So this one, this, this technique is started to give us surgeons the ability to actually see without opening. So here, I don't have any, um, any cut really, apart from a tiny little one centimeter cut in the, in the pelvis of this person, but my, my pointer can really go exactly in the area where there is, in this case, a tumor in the pelvis, so I can uh, do a small procedure such as, for example, a thermal ablation or, a, uh, or inject some cement to reinforce that bone. Um, so I, have, I am absolutely sure that I am in the right place. And in the pelvis sometimes, like in the shoulder girl or in some other place, it's actually quite difficult because it's very, very deep down. So here, this is my ponta, and that corresponds to the tip of this that we call chicken foot, and I don't have to explain it why. Um, right, the tip of that is exactly in this point, and then I can measure how far I have to be or how far uh, more I need to go. So this already gave us very good um, help on doing certain procedures. But what we can actually do even more with navigation is to plan. So one thing that I can do, this is a case that I did only a um, few weeks ago here, is a lady that has a bad sarcoma coming from an ileum here. So these are the hips of this lady, and that's, that's the tumor in there that you can see on, a, on this scan and here on the axial scan, just like the salami slices of a body. And that's the big tumor in there. So what I needed to do is to plan, plan my surgery. And in, in orthopedic oncology, one of the main things that we need to get is good margin. So I have to do my cuts away from the tumor, otherwise this tumor comes back. So what I do with the navigation, I actually can plan where I'm gonna do my cuts. So even before, so the patient is still at home, it's just done a CT scan and an MRI, I fuse the pictures together, because especially the, uh, often the tumors are not just in the bone, but also in the soft tissues. So I fuse the pictures together, and this is the tumor that has been uh, drawn in the 3D picture of that, of that pelvis. And then I basically sit down in front of a computer and I say, all right, okay, what I wanna do, I wanna do a cut here and then join with this cut here and then join with this cut here because this will give me, uh, I'm far away from the tumor. Um, I know where the vessels are, so I know, for example, how difficult it's gonna be or how easy it's gonna be in my resection um, and I can plan that. And then what I can do is that in surgery, I can really match exactly my plans to what's happening to my, to my patient because basically uh, by doing that CT scan during surgery, then I can point 
exactly where certain landmarks are and I know exactly where my uh, surgical tools are in relationship to that person live uh, while, I do my, uh, while I do my surgery. So this is a great advance for people that do surgeries like I do sometimes. So they are really dangerous for, for, um, for the patients, but also it gives me the confidence of being oncologically safe and also safe from, uh, from the point of view of, um, of important structures. And as you can see here, I sort of, I managed to really do exactly those cuts that I wanted. This is just a little reconstruction that I needed to do, but my cuts correspond exactly to my three lines that I'd drawn um, before. This also managed, you know, in doing this way, I didn't even have to, for example, damage some structures that otherwise are too difficult to recognize, and I might do some, I'll remove more bone than required, which then creates more problems functionally, for example, to that person. Um, so by doing this, the, the navigation in surgery, I can really improve not just the quality of my surgery, but then the outcome uh, for the patient. So that's, that's about the navigation and being able to plan before and then try to match what we planned before with, um, with surgery. And what about robots? Now, this is a, the, new, the new surgery, something that is really starting to take big scene in, um, in surgery, obviously not just orthopedics. This is an example of a robot that is called the Da Vinci robot, which is mainly for general surgery and urology. So just to show you how you know, the evolution was, we had first just you know, surgeon and his hand, his or her hands, um, you know, and their technical skills. Then we had minimally invasive surgery, so laparoscopy, or in, in orthopedics, arthroscopy, so little keyholes. We put a camera uh, inside the joint or inside the belly, we see where, where things are, and then with another hole, we get the instrument in there and we do what we need to do. Now, the problem with laparoscopy or arthroscopy is that your freedom of movement is really minimal. You only can play with those two instruments, and one of them is a camera, so you really don't have a huge amount of freedom of movement. What robots can do instead, they basically, especially this type of robot here, basically is, works as your hands inside the patient, but you are away from the patient. So this is a, well, that's fine. This is just, a, just, a, just to tell you that um, robotic surgery didn't start yesterday, but um, clearly the, the original uh, ideas were certainly out there, uh, but didn't really deliver the way it is now. But this is now why robotic surgery can and is becoming more and more uh, efficient, because it can really mimic the function of our hands. So the, this robot here and is something that I don't use, but when I talk to my colleagues, they tell me that basically those, those handles and those, um, those instruments can really mimic exactly what the surgeon's hand would do. So this is the way it looks, is we have a surgeon that sits in a console, has the head completely embedded into a, uh, looks like almost a virtual reality uh, type picture. Um, some surgeons like not to use shoes, and um, so they're nice and comfy. Um, not scrubbed, so obviously it helps on sterility as well. And this is instead the robot that does the operation. So it almost looks like a spider with all these arms, and they're all pointing towards the, the abdomen, in this case, of the person. So, Obviously, one of these arms would have a camera, and all the others have um, instruments that are driven by the surgeon's hand. So the surgeon has a view, and the view is fantastic because it's not just magnifying, and you can magnify, zoom in and out as much as you like, things that obviously you can't do in surgery uh, because your view is just one. Uh, it's 3D. You can really move around, and you are inside the abdomen of that person, so you can really look 360 degrees on what's happening inside. It's very ergonomic, so it's nice and comfy, and I tell you that sometimes when you're 12 hours in surgery, you would like to be seated for 12 hours rather than, rather than standing. Um, and the instruments are wristed, so you really have that freedom of, of mobility. One problem is that you don't have one of those things that we surgeons or humans, we really love, which is the sense of touch, that feedback of understanding how the tissue feels like. So that's something that obviously um, is not there. So you need a lot of training to be able to actually maneuver one thing, you know, a thing like that. I'm, I guess that you know, junior, you know, more young people are going to be much better uh, than than you know, um, old school surgeons because you know they've been used to 
you know, deal with joysticks and virtual reality for quite a long time. Uh, but, you know, the lack of touch is one, one of the problems. Now, there is a video of surgery. It's, it, there's no blood, though, so I'll, and I will go fast. Um, but this is the way it looks from the inside. So you can see that there is a camera in there, and the surgeon can move around. Um, and all these instruments can really work in there in a seamless way. Uh, you can uh, clot the, the, the blood vessels at the same time. You can really move around and just go zoom in and out uh, in a nice way. And you can see how the surgeon's hands have this... Um, little joystick that really, if, if, if the surgeon does that, the instrument would, that, would do that with the exact same speed and the exact same um, strength. So it's, a, it's, pretty, it's pretty impressive. What about in, in, in orthopedics? Obviously, we have our own robot, and I'm very proud. I, I love using the robot in surgery. It's one of those things that um, is just, is, is, it's just fun. Um, Sorry. <laughs> so it's, the, the robot in, in orthopedic surgery is not one of those that I sit down and relax and just tell the robot what to do. You actually need to be in there. You need to be scrubbed in and use that. But the difference with this, between this and the navigation is that you can actually plan all of this surgery before the patient is even in. So all we do, as we do a CT scan of that patient's knee, for example, and then we, before the patient is even in surgery, I decide what type of procedure I'm going to put in. I can see uh, what is the gap, what is the size, where I'm going to put all, when I'm going to do all my cuts. And then the robot makes me do exactly what I've planned. So basically, when I do all my approach and everything, the robot, what it does is that performs the cuts exactly in the position that I have planned before on a 3D plan, but not only performs the cuts in those way, it actually stops me if I want to do something bad. So it's got a, it's got a magnetic type haptic that if you keep pushing, it literally stops up until, it, it literally you know, pushes you back up until it just stops and just say that's enough, you tried enough to damage the blood vessels of this person here or the, or the ligaments of this person. So you can really not just promise a certain type of precision, but also from my point of view, the biggest thing is that it's actually very safe because, you know, we're surgeons, we might damage structures where, um, in advent, you know, without, without wanting to, but in this case here, yeah, by using that, I actually can't because the robot would stop me on going away from the only that area there that I want to cut. Um, and the other, the other nice thing is that, as you can see how, how much it sort of, um, i just go, go back here. You can really see how the, um, the instruments is followed exactly by what happens in the video. So many times these surgeries are actually done by looking at the screen rather than looking at what's happening in there. And it's really, it's really strange because as a surgeon, you know, we're always focused on, you know, on that wound in there. But now we're starting to get used to actually look at the screen and understand whether you know, what we're doing actually corresponds to exactly um, what we planned um, to do. And we can really go to the precision of a 0.1 of a millimeter. So that is something that you know, is impossible with the human eye to really do something so precise and so uh, accurate. It's another example of, uh, of the way we do you know, sometimes a hip replacement uh, by that. You can, we, we can scroll through the scans. We can really check and double check before putting any implant where that would sit. Sorry for the banging. Where that would sit and where, and where um, um, it will look before. We don't even need to take an x-ray afterwards because it, it just will be exactly in that position. So really, it helps us. It's not something that can replace us, or at least for sure in terms of in orthopedics. As a surgeon, we're starting to become more the, 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 the minds behind the surgery. It's not just the technicality of doing the cuts. It is actually the planning that will, will make that operation be, being successful. Because then we know that the, um, the, the, the performance of that will, is basically guaranteed. But if I plan incorrectly, then the patient is not going to be happy. So that's all about um, robotics. And what about 3D printing? This is another massive area, and it's something that is becoming everywhere. In surgery, 3D printing is, is, is everywhere. Now, if you go to Aldi, you can get a 3D printer. It doesn't cost much, and it's great. It makes you do a lot of, lot of fun things. All you need is a little computer. You make the pictures that you want, and it can really create the Eiffel Tower or whatever nice piece of art you like to make. So 
3D printer is very accessible now and understanding how they work is not that hard because all it is is just addictive, additive sorry, manufacturing. So it's something that you go layer by layer and you deposit whatever material uh, you need to deposit to create that 3D um, sculpture or structure. Usually, obviously, the 3D printers that we can buy um, uh, print um, special plastic that melts um, so it gets really, really hot and then it creates and then hardens up as soon as it touches the surface and then it can create these 3D um, structures. So it's not a concept that now is, is unaffordable. It's something that you can, you can find anywhere. What about in surgery? We can use 3D printing in a huge amount of, of ways and I'm sure that there are plenty others that we're not even thinking about. One of the ways is to plan. So there are some conditions, one of the examples, for example, is a, is a congenital heart deformities where it's really difficult to understand the anatomy of that particular heart in this case because all you can do or you, all you could do before was just looking at CT scans and slide after slide after slide. On all you, and, and what you had to do was to create in your mind the 3D version of what you're looking at, you know, slide after slide. So it actually is not that easy, and especially in conditions where, you know, it, there's no normal anatomy that you can really refer to. The other option it was to have 3D reconstruction, but it was still on a screen. So the difference that 3D printing made in the planning of some surgeries is that it could really create a version of that specific heart for that specific patient that you can have in your hands. It's printed with, you know, in plastics. Um, so it takes no time on printing that. And you can have it in your hand, you can open it up and you can really understand what's going on in the heart of that person. So before you go into surgery, you can really, you know what to expect and you're not going to get to, you know, by surprise on understanding, oh, whoa, I wasn't expecting here to be a septum, I wasn't expecting here to be uh, this structure. So that helps considerably in the planning for surgery. Another help for planning is when you have a tumor and you need to cut out a tumor. This is an example uh, of, a, of a tumor in a kidney because you can see the relationship of that tumor with the blood vessels, with the nerves, and this basically gives you as a surgeon an idea on what needs to go, what can stay, and how safe you can be and what your surgery can actually be. And also you can tell the patient what to expect because really you, you know you can plan in a way that is much more reliable compared to you know, by, you know, you know, an educated guessing of looking at a CT scan. Another way that we can use 3D printing for planning is, for example, in orthopedics, on planning for reconstruction of deformities. So if we have, for example, a, um, a bone that is, is deformed in some way, we can print a model of that bone and print a model of that bone also with what would happen once we do the, um, the resection of the extra bone or the, our correction. So you can see how straight it would look, but also, you can print your cutting guides. And that helps incredibly as a surgeon because basically these cutting guides will correspond exactly to the, uh, to the, to the femur or the tibia of that person. So you can, you can have them printed sterile and you can put them in the bone because it, it, it fits perfectly. You know exactly when you're gonna do your cuts. So your correction is perfect because you have planned that before. And it's something that sometimes when you, when you think in 3D, it's really difficult to actually understand the, all the deformities that, that um, needs to be corrected. So that helped very much in, um, in planning for surgery. But 3D printing can be used to implant. So we can actually, and it's, it's almost every, especially orthopedic companies, um, are able now to 3D print metal that can go into the body. And these obviously are for custom made, you know, but also now all the, you know, a lot of, lot of companies just offer normal 3D printing, um, 3D printed hips or knee re joint replacement, uh, because it's actually quite cheap and it's quite quick to have one of these implants. It's actually quicker and cheaper than the standard ways. But in tumor surgery is actually something that helped considerably because uh, you might have uh, read, I think it was a couple of years ago, about the, um, the titanium heel that Professor Chung put on one of, one of his patients. So it's one of those things that, you know, when you have no other solutions or your solution is, for example, an amputation, then, you know, you, and you know that you can actually remove the tumor, but then your problem is the reconstruction. 3D printing gives you the ability of thinking outside the square and thinking, well, is there a way that I can actually reconstruct this defect uh, 
in a, you know, in a safe way. And this was, this was the idea behind the, the titanium heel, but you can have 3D printing or 3D printed uh, structures that can really reproduce and re, uh, regenerate, recreate that bone um, uh, defect that you have created. One of the examples and one of the things that, you know, the most common uh, reason why we use 3D printing in surgery, in orthopedic surgery, is again oncology and is the reconstruction of the pelvis. The pelvis is such a difficult and deep place and is surrounded by pretty important structures and is a nightmare when you have a tumour in that area there. So 3D printing can give you the chance of, one, planning uh, with, with navigation. You, you can have your cutting guides, as I said before, you can have them printed so they can really fit exactly uh, that patient. Um, and then you can have your implant that fits exactly that defect that you're going to create because the, it's all constructed based on what your cutting guides were. So you can really have your resection that looks exactly as your, your bit that you're going to put back in to, um, to, to fill that hole. And if you look at the, sometimes it, you know, the pictures are pretty impressive because you can see how in this CT scan the fit of this implant is absolutely perfect and it's something that there is no way that we can achieve with anything else, certainly uh, not with allograft, certainly not with uh, you know, handmade you know, cement or, uh, or any custom made, even if it's custom made prosthesis, it can, just cannot fit that way because in surgery you can't do the cuts that you're planning unless you have some sort of guide. So 3D printing for um, reconstruction in orthopedics is, is huge at the moment and is really helping, is really helping a lot. What about printing cells? That's the other very exciting uh, part of 3D printing. So now, yes, we can print cells um, and we, we can create structures that keep the cells alive and that keep them becoming what we want them to become. So obviously to 3D print cells, different concepts have to be considered. Now, if you think about your 3D printer that you buy at Aldi, you have that, that line of, of plastic that needs to be melted to then create whatever, whatever structure you want to create. Now, you can't melt the cells because, well, you can, but then they're not going to work. Um, so you need to have a biocompatible way of delivering and giving these cells an environment where they can survive and they can become what we want them to become. So usually they're printed in something that we call hydrogels, and they are the most common uh, materials, biomaterials that we use for printing cells. So these hydrogels are like, you know, just jelly uh, type structures. And uh, when they're printed, they can then create 3D structures. Now, there are different processes to make them become from liquid, semi-liquid, to actually solid. And all these processes can actually damage the cell. So it's not, it's not a, the, easiest, the easiest thing to do, but it's certainly something that, um, that is doable. Now, look at this. This is a big, bulky machine. It's a tiny little one. Now, as a surgeon, we like to translate techniques in surgery. So it's something that for us, like, well, we always think, how can we have this technology being applied in surgery? Yes, we can create a little, a little piece of, I don't know, cartilage, bone, and then put it back and plunk it into, into the body. Is that going to work? We actually have plenty of data that shows, no, it's not going to work for some tissues. It doesn't work, and especially for cartilage, which is what I am uh, passionate about in terms of regenerating. So as surgeons, we think, all right, okay, well, let's give power back to the surgeon, if you like, um, and let's create a printer that we can actually use as surgeons. So what we, what, what we, what we thought was like, well, can we have a printer that we can help, we can, you can, we can have in our hand, just like any other surgical instrument, that delivers um, material with cells inside, and these cells make what we want them to make to regenerate a tissue. And this is where, you know, when, when the biopen uh, that you might have heard of, you know, came, came, into, came into place, this idea of being able to 3D print or to extrude the tissue that could have that uh, capability. Um, and when we started, we, we had to obviously do a lot of tests, and we keep doing a lot of tests to understand whether um, this material uh, works, but the main thing that we needed to do was to protect the cells 
because these cells, when they're printed, they, they get a lot of stress. But also, as I said before, you need to create that material in a way that is actually hardens up in a way. So we have to expose this material with what we call um, photo curing process. So it's a, it's a process that um, you, you, you shine UV light to, mat to material. The material has got a what we call photo initiator, which is something that makes, makes it become hard. But all these things actually hurt the cells. So the way the biopen works is that we actually protect the cells with creating a core shell uh, type structure. So the cells are in a little niche, and as soon as the, uh, the, the toxic uh, environment ceases to be in there, which takes only a few seconds, then the cells are free to move and free to do what they want to do. And these are some of the results uh, that we got. So this is a piece of cartilage, and all this green here is all the what we call the collagen type 2, which is the collagen that we like in normal cartilage for a knee, for a hip. Um, and this is the way it looks inside. So this green instead is actually the scaffold. And all these blue um, dots in there, they are actually the cells. And these are the bodies of the cells. These are stem cells of a human person. Um, so we managed to create and to print something that is alive and is actually, can actually substitute a tissue and become the tissue that we want them to be. Now, before doing this, obviously, in the, in the human knee, we need to do that in vitro, and this is, this is what we've done, and we created uh, neocartilage. So the idea is to, if you have a lesion, for example, in the knee, which we know is the precursor of osteoarthritis, so it's something that um, if we leave it this way, it's going to make this person have arthritis maybe in their 40s, and you don't want someone to stop working, stop playing tennis, golf, or whatever, or just kneeling down and enjoying you know, playing with their kids just because of something that happened by playing footy, for example. Um, also, we have no other options. In, in surgery and orthopedics, we actually don't know what to do to stop this thing from becoming arthritis. So the concept is to, when we have this these, these, uh, injury there, we use the pen in surgery, and we print this material within the defect. And then after the photo curing, which means making this material becoming hard, um, then these stem cells are embedded in this hydrogel, and then slowly, thanks to their viability and thanks to the ability of them to uh, resist to load bearing and, to, um, and to, the, uh, to the stress, they can actually then become healthy cartilage and get the cartilage regeneration that we want. And this is an example of what we did. This is just a ship. This is not human. We, 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 not, we haven't done that in humans yet. But this is the way it would work. And you can see, you know, I'm using that just like any other surgical instrument. So it's something that, and this is the only one that exists in the world, because every time I go around, they all, everyone says, oh, this is a fantastic idea. But no one really ever tried anything like this. So we, in Australia, sometimes we don't realize how much forward we are and how much advanced our, our uh, research is compared to you know, anyone else. And we can really use this. And the, the results of this were actually quite impressive because it can tackle some of the problems that if you, put, if you make something in the lab and then you plunk it into the body, it actually doesn't work. So we can actually tackle these problems of the um, matching, you know, the mismatching of the donor with, the, with what, you, what, what you're creating. Um, in this case, ray of curvature and uh, stiffness, all these things that you can, you can really solve just by putting something exactly in that position at the time and point of need. So it's actually not that easy to get to the clinical trial. These are, these are the example of the biopen, just to show you that you know, there is a lot of steps in one, two, three, four. There are some of the, our key publications that I forgot to put down here. But these are all the steps that we need to get just to get to clinical trial. So a lot of time, people call me, call my rooms, and just say, oh, can I, have, can I please be your guinea pig? Can I please have this, this, this um, uh, procedure done? It's actually a huge amount of work before that because we need to prove that what we're doing actually works. Otherwise, it's the wrong way of doing things. If, you, if, we, if we try that straight away into, uh, into the humans just because there is that excitement of the moment and then we don't get the right results, also our credibility um, is, is not there anymore. So there is a lot of work that is done there and there is a lot of blocks uh, that you know, prevent us to go straight away into, um, into humans. And obviously we need to follow them because uh, all these rules make us become, you know, not just good researchers, but also being able to get to the results in a reliable uh, and consistent way. Another thing very, very quickly is something that, you know, I don't do, but it's something that's super exciting out there, which is the organ on a chip. I don't know if you've ever heard about this, and it's basically the ability of creating a single organ literally in a tiny little chip. All of this is not for implantable reasons, 
but is actually to try and study the way some drugs, for example, can respond based on recreating the organ and all the homeostasy inside that organ, recreating that in a chip. Uh, so it's a, it's a microfluidic channel cell culture chip that simulates the activities, mechanism, and physiological response of that entire organ. Um, so you can see exactly what you do. One of the examples is the lung on a chip. So you basically have inside this tiny little chip that looks like in here, you have the air channel, the blood channel, and then you have uh, the, the cells that creates the... Um, the lung. And these cells are in contact with each other, in contact with air and blood, exactly in the way it would actually happen in the organ. So in this way, if you, if, you, if you give a molecule, you can really study the effects of that molecule in, you know, with those cells and the, the relationship with all the environment. So you can study the molecules, you can study um, tumors and their development, uh, and this is a, really an exciting way of understanding what happens in vivo without using live animals or certainly humans. Um, so the organ on a chip can replace animal models and it is the great advantage of that. Um, you can get to the stage of clinical trials, again, uh, without using models and you can compare studies of drugs on humans and animals. You can compare uh, and, and see the interactions of uh, tumor cells, for example, with the organ cells. You can study toxicity of drugs, you can, or cosmetics. It's a huge amount of things that you can actually do without going into the in vivo uh, part, but you can't implant them, which is good. So what's the future? Um, I, I, I think that, you know, it's certainly as a surgeon, it's extremely exciting because we, we don't even know what the future can give us. One of the things is certainly virtual reality, and we can see that we're seeing that more and more often, especially in training. It's something that, you know, no one really likes to be operated on by the first timer, uh, resident, or a surgeon, of, uh, you know, surgeon in training. So virtual reality can actually help us on training people um, to, um, before they actually go into surgery. Augmented reality is something different. It's not the same thing. Augmented reality is something that, you know, I'm operating, I put my glasses on, there are, for example, Google glasses, and I can see the scans, for example, on the side of my eye, I can see um, my plan in the side of my eye, on the side of my eye, I can do a search and just look at the anatomy the way it's supposed to be, and then I can compare it with what I'm seeing. So that's the augmented reality. That's something that can really help while we do surgery. And obviously then, artificial intelligence, it's something that is, uh, uh, is coming more and more. But if you ask me, I don't think that surgeons are gonna be out of their job uh, certainly not in my lifetime, so that's, that's good, but it's, a, it's something that we, we, we're seeing more and more often. And that's, that's all. This is just my, um, my team in the Biofab 3D, which is really a um, very fancy place. If you haven't been there, um, we're organizing, um, we always organize lots of events, so it's a, it's a fantastic place. And the beautiful thing of this place is that it really gives that connection between the hospital and the problems that we have in the, you know, as in to treat, you know, as, as surgeons or doctors or uh, clinicians to treat disease and then we can actually really uh, link that with the, with the lab. But obviously, mainly I need to thank my family because all the time that I spend in the lab or in the, or in, in theater is thanks to them that, you know, they give me the chance to do all of this. That's all. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Dr. Diabella again. Thank you. We'd just like to thank the network's partners who make events like this possible, um, this one and in the future. And thank you for joining us for this event. We hope to see you again.